welcome to this edition of Cyber Focus, your source for international business news. I'm Taylor, and with me today is Professor Brass, Assistant Professor at the Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Ms. Bratz is here to talk to us today about her current research on the integration of non-governmental organizations in government. Professor Brass, thanks for joining us today. Sure, thanks for inviting me. Well, so the first thing I'd love to talk to you about is your long-term passion for the role of non-governmental organizations in government. I'm curious, how did you find your start in life? Um, well, I got involved in, I developed an interest in Africa Surprisingly enough, as a small child, I went to a um, French language immersion summer camp. Um, and my favorite camp counselor had spent um, years in Cameroon. And so I decided about at the age of 12 or 13 that I was going to go to Africa when I was in college. And so I spent a year studying in Senegal and West Africa as an undergrad and um, sort of took off from there. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> very interesting. And I know you published many of your findings, but how did you get started then in this field after college? What were the set type of things that mm -hmm. you did? So um, after I finished uh, my undergrad degree, I worked for a couple of years at a nonprofit in D.C. Um, and then I spent a little bit of time in, or about a year, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and I was working at a really small nonprofit there um, non-governmental organization, and this was in the early 2000s. Um, and at that point, Kenya was um, nearing the end of the rule of Daniel Arab Moy, who is sort of a quasi-dictator or dictator, depending on what year we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a, there were a lot of tensions between NGOs and governments, and so I became really interested in understanding how nonprofits could provide services or not given different sort of political regime types and how NGOs worked with governments or worked against governments uh, to get things done. So that's, I headed back to grad school after that. Okay, so then you got your graduate degree in non-governmental work or? No, so my graduate degree, my doctorate's in political science actually. Okay. So it's looking at um, the interactions of different types of actors in service provision. So looking at how the role that non-governmental actors play in providing services in poor countries. Okay, that's mm -hmm. very interesting. Um, in your research, you mentioned NGO involvement in many developing countries in Africa. Could you talk a little bit about your experience working in or with the local communities in these developing countries? Mm -hmm. So when I, before I went to graduate school, I worked in a, an organization in one of the slums of Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya. I was working in the industrial area. Um, and so some of the challenges there were, uh, I guess the main challenge was getting resources for the organization. Um, it happened to be that the this particular organization had been a project of a large um, international NGO, and it was developing, it had spun off and was developing itself as its own organization. So a lot of the things that we worked on were sort of uh, fundamental organizational management skills like fundraising and accounting and human resource management um, and things like that that were, um, the organization was sort of firefighting all of these issues as they came up. Mm -hmm. And so the, the biggest challenge was sort of systematizing how do you start an organization and, and, and then um, move from firefighting mode to long-term planning and things like that. And with those resources, resources such as the financial resources, I mean, working in Africa and in a developing country, did, what kind of challenges did you face in getting those resources to there and, and connecting kind of with uh, larger organizations mm -hmm. back at home? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we, we worked on doing was um, diversifying the funding sources. So they had had sort of one donor um, at a time, and that donor kept, or the, that series of donors kept pulling out at some point. And so we worked on getting, you know, let's get some amount of funding from one source, some amount of funding from another source, so that if any one donor left, you didn't have complete collapse of the organization. Right. Um, and then we also did, so those were mostly international sources of funding, so doing fundraising in the United States um, for idiosyncratic reasons, also in Ireland. Um, and then within Kenya and within Nairobi, 
and specifically actually within the industrial area, we went to local area companies. So they're big industries in the same neighborhood as this organization was located and, and got um, in-kind donations. So one company, food processing company, was willing to donate meals. Uh, um, another company was willing to donate milk every day. And so um, they have a, a program that involves children. So that's, um, we sort of tried to get different things from different places. That's very cool that you were able to collaborate with the other organizations in that area mm -hmm. to kind of work together and to get the funding and other resources that you wouldn't think about when you really are in a country that's still developing. Mm -hmm. So how did the culture impact the outcome of the projects that you were a part of? Did that play a factor? Um, like how I did think you integrate with the culture? Well, what, one thing I did was take Swahili lessons. So Swahili um, is the national language of Kenya, uh, but most Kenyans speak English as well. So um, Kenya is a more developed African country. So Nairobi looks a lot like cities around the world with you know skyscrapers and highways. And um, but it's it's interesting in that you have those things right alongside you know slum communities mm -hmm. where people are living in um, what we would probably call shacks. Um, so one of the things that's challenging is sort of to, to deal with those two sides of the same city and to move in and out between them, I found was challenging. But um, culturally, it's not, the community I was working in was not so dissimilar from communities here in the U.S. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Getting into a little bit more of the specifics about your research, you talked about the impacts of small-scale renewable energy generation. What type of outcomes did you notice in the short term that differed from the long term? Mm -hmm. So some of my research focuses on um, NGOs and service provision specifically, and then some of it looks at different actors' involvement in energy services um, in particular. And so um, when we are looking at renewable energy, small-scale renewable energy generation across the world, one of the things that we um, we found was there are a lot of projects that are being started. So for example, small scale solar projects at the community level, or someone will build a very small dam to do hydropower um, on a river or a stream. And we found that a lot of those things were quite successful in the short term because they were addressed from a technical or engineering standpoint, but then they failed on the long term. So if you went back three years, five years, 10 years later, they weren't happening anymore. Um, and we found that that the problems there were in terms of um, program management, managerial capacity within the community where they were implemented, um, maintenance issues, so there either weren't funds or knowledge of how to do maintenance of the electrical systems that were implemented, and then sometimes community organizing. So the community hadn't been um, involved in the implementation or the idea of the project maybe didn't have a strong interest or feel that it was that important, or the way that payment systems were set up. So if you had to pay for the electricity, maybe those systems were set up in a way that people either couldn't afford or didn't have an incentive to stay involved with um, for the long term. So those were sort of, a lot of them really did work in the short term and then failed in, in a sort of medium three to five year term. Okay, and so and then with these companies that have failed in the long term, I mean, is there organizations that come back in and maybe help to rebuild that? Or what's the process in the future, I guess? That's a great question. Um, in most cases, not necessarily. There wasn't necessarily, I guess in a lot of cases, aren't necessarily linkages developed between the communities and the donor or the business or the sort of outside funder of the, of the initial thing. And so when it fails, those outside organizations often have moved on to do something different. Um, and so they don't come back and fix it or figure out, okay, what did we do wrong and let's let's go back and redo it, um, which is obviously problematic. Ideally, as more research gets comes out about the things that are hampering long-term success, you'd want to see companies, NGOs, governments implementing these things. And a lot of it is sort of, in my opinion, is a is a problematic answer. It's an answer that people don't want to hear, which is that it just takes longer to implement these programs than people are taking to do them. 
So if you really want to train a community in the engineering needed or even just the maintenance needed for a, a, a solar array or a, a small hydro power station, mm -hmm. it's just going to take longer than, than the amount of time you want to do it in. So you have to do a training program that might last a year rather than, you know, a two Saturdays, day long Saturdays where you train maintenance workers. Right. Um, so then would that require obviously then additional funding or would you have to kind of revamp the timeline for the projects, mm -hmm. for example? Yeah. I think often it will be the timeline over funding. Um, but thinking also about once you've trained people, how do you convince them to stay in those communities? Because a lot of times once you've trained them really well, they then have an incentive to go somewhere else where they can maybe get paid more for the services that they're providing. So that would be another thing is figuring out how do you, how do you generate revenues so that you keep the people able to do jobs in the place where you've yeah. Especially in, le in the least developed areas of countries. That's very interesting. I would an interesting point you, that you that you brought up that I would never think like once you teach someone they could potentially leave because here once you teach someone you're kind of committed to that two year job or and then you have to sign non compete clauses. But there, I mean, they can just go anywhere. So that's mm -hmm. really interesting that you bring that up. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of want to switch tracks a little bit here. Our audience includes both professionals and students. Uh, what kind of advice would you have to new graduates or professionals in your field? Um, to new graduates, especially undergraduates, my advice would be take a couple of years off before going back to um, graduate school, if you're thinking about graduate school. I think that getting work experience, you know, even entry level work experience is really critical for having an idea of what you want to do in the future. I know not all parents will agree with that. A lot of parents want you to go directly into grad school. But my advice is to take take a little time and try out a couple of things, see what you like, where your interests lie um, before going back. You know, your early 20s is the time that you can do that. And as mm -hmm. you get older, it gets harder and harder. Um, so that's what I would say to, to, to recent undergraduates. Um, and for professionals, I guess I would say um, professionals who are working in international development, who are working in nonprofits, government, or businesses, I would say, you know, ask around about what's worked and what's failed, and really think a lot about the things that have failed and why they've failed, and try to learn from the past, um, rather than sort of saying, okay, that didn't work, let's just do something different. Um, yeah. And so with your research and publications, now that you've you had published lots of studies. Is there anything that you see on the horizon that you're particularly excited about or in the future that you would love to work with? Yeah, one of the things I think that's really new and interesting and to me exciting going on, particularly in the energy services, but actually in nonprofits sort of generally, as you're seeing um, new forms of interactions, not just between NGOs and governments, but also NGOs and businesses. So you're seeing um, on the more on the business side, social enterprises where businesses are doing things with a social mission, but you're also seeing nonprofits that are trying to be more sustainable, financially sustainable, by um, spinning off private businesses from NGOs to help fund the NGO. You're seeing more NGOs working with businesses to provide services. And then you're seeing more NGOs, businesses, and governments working together to make things happen. Um, and and, and in, I've seen this quite a lot in the small scale uh, renewable energy generation, but, um, but I've been talking with people about it's happening in a lot of different sectors. So sort of looking at this collaboration between the different types of sectors in developing countries, I think, is um, something to keep an eye on. It's good to know, and especially with business being coming even more global. I mean, it's not just connecting countries now, it's connecting every different layer of government, politics, the economy and everything. So it's really interesting that you that you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And that concludes this edition of Cyber Focus. Thank you, Professor Brass, for coming in and speaking with us today. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future topics, please contact CIBER at indiana.edu.